There was a really great comment left on my video the other day. It was talking about if you overwater and water too often your plants, you basically take away the incentive for that plant to send its root structure down deep in search of moisture. And so what you have left with is a plant that is not as strong or as healthy as it could be. When you take away the incentive to work for the things that you need, you become sick and dependent. Kind of like our culture is today. It's been a while since we talked about this, but I think we need to go over and check out how the quail are doing. All right, so what do we have in here? Okay, these are quail eggs that uh, our birds have hatched, and I'm getting ready to incubate them. Okay. And if you keep your eggs between 45 and 65, you can keep them for up to a week, and they'll remain fertile, rather than keeping them at, at room temperature. Okay. Now, one little gadget that I recommend that people buy is these little thermometers. Uh-huh. They come six to a pack. They're real cheap. You can do it for all kinds of things. We have one in our uh, root cellar. You can put them in your incubator to verify the temperature. Huh. And I put them in here so I know what the temperature is inside the ice chest waiting. For. And these will be incubated in the next when? I'll probably put them in the incubator this afternoon once I get uh, the eggs this afternoon. Awesome. Quail, lay their, quail lay their eggs late in the afternoon and in the evening. Chickens lay their eggs in the morning. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Okay. All right, now these quail have just hatched. And what's this device right here? It's a heat plate. Okay. You know how tiny they are. Mm -hmm. Now in the past I've uh, used kerosene lanterns mm -hmm. to provide heat for the quail. But I recently got these uh, heat plates. They're working out pretty well for us. They don't take a whole lot of power and I got extra batteries, so. They're just popping their heads out a little bit yeah. there, and that's some, is that some scratch right there that they're eating? Yeah, I put scratch in there. They're, they they won't eat out of the feeder just yet. Huh. And so what do we got here? These are eggs I'm waiting to hatch, but I'm kind of having my doubts whether they hatch or now, not. Now these didn't you didn't grow these? These came from the no, post the, office. These came through the post postal system. Yeah, where'd you order these from? Uh, they came from Southwest Game Birds. Okay, they're in Arizona. I had them come. UPS uh, Priority Express, mm -hmm. but the post office screwed up and they came two days late. And so with four or five days of them traveling through the postal system, <laughs> you didn't do the hatch rate any, yeah, any good. We'll so it. I don't think they're going to probably hatch, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, hoping you might get a few out of them. Yeah. I saw one that was in here flopping around uh, yesterday. Yeah. So... But for the most part, you know, you're you're confident your eggs that we're the ones yeah. we're laying are going to do fine. When you lay, have your own legs lay, you'll get anywhere from about eighty to one hundred percent hatch rate. That's awesome. Yeah. The other thing, this little gadget, I think everybody ought to have for their eggs. Yeah. It's originally made to uh, air conditioning technicians use this to measure the air temp coming out of their uh, air ducts. Yeah. But I've used this thing to measure your, your birds. You can, you can reach in here. You can measure your floor temperature. See, I like to keep about 80, 85 for floor temperature. Uh -huh. If it's too cold, then I can adjust this upwards. And then I can measure the temperature of the bird. And if I can keep that bird at 85 to 90 degrees, they're happy. They're happy. Now, conventional wisdom says, you know, you watch your birds. They get too close together. They're cold. Mm -hmm. If you get them too far apart, they're hot. Right. Forget that stuff. <laughs> get one of these and measure their temperature and you know what's going on. <laughs> now, this one here, I feel bad about. You see how its legs? That's called spraddle leg. Uh-huh. It can't pull its legs up underneath him. Why is it? Why did that happen? It just, their legs get twisted inside the eggshell. Huh. Or sometimes, if they hatch, if they're on a slick surface, mm -hmm. uh, their feet spread out. But that's not the case. Will he survive to be a meat bird? If he can continue to walk, yeah. Yeah. The trouble is, he has a hard time walking. Hmm. Yeah, I see that. Poor guy. We're going to go now check out the coop so you can see where the quail are kept once they reach or become of age.
Huh? So how do you how many do you keep to a cage we have here? So how does have, this system work? I have 12 hens and three cocks. All right. So how old are these guys? They're uh, about 10 weeks now. 10 weeks old. And when do we butcher? Uh, these I'll keep for breeders. Okay. But it, about seven weeks is when I'll, I'll butcher them. Okay. You can do it at six, but they put on a little little extra meat at seven. Seven. Weeks, yeah. Is your water system, did you ever figure that out? Yeah. We have these things that uh, they fill gravity feed from way down at, at the far end. Uh huh. And the weight of the water will fill the. You gotta lift it up. Oh, yeah, okay. And the water flows into it. Yeah, okay. And what's not, I, I've got some others I can show you. Mm hmm. But they require water pressure in order to fill. These do really well with just gravity. That's nice, because yeah, water pressure uh, requires a water system. Yeah. <laughs> and then, this is the type of feeder I think everybody should make. Yeah. It's made out of a uh, a plastic uh, shoe box. Mm -hmm. Just a simple tote from Walmart. Yeah, for made for shoes. Mm -hmm. And you just put a, I put an inch and a half hole in there, about oh, an inch and a half, two inches above the, the floor. Right. And because quail, when they eat, they're throwing food all over the place. <laughs> and this prevents them from wasting so much feed. Yeah. And then on this side, I, don't, I open it slowly so I don't scare them. Oh, there's an egg. There's some younger birds in there. And when the birds first start laying eggs, you'll get soft shell eggs. You get double yolks. You get eggs that aren't totally speckled. You get and you get tiny eggs, and that lasts for about a week before they start actually laying eggs that are uh, fertile. And so here I have a sandbox. And that's just for them. To, that's like they're yeah, like they're, they they're, can take a bath in it. They usually lay their eggs in it. Okay. And then I I have a uh, a sifter I can. Uh, so, right, to clean all the garbage out. Yeah, I clean all the junk out once a week. Yeah. And if somebody can tell me where I can find a bigger one, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> this is made for reptile cages, <laughs> and I'd love to have a bigger one. I'll, I'll be uh, butchering about half of these next week. They're about seven weeks. Or the, no, this is the hen. The hens have uh, stripes on the breast. This is a male. See, he doesn't have stripes on his on his breast. Okay. Okay. So I banned him, and he's got blue. Yeah. Because he's a boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that that's not gonna fly on YouTube. <laughs> this our watering system holds 10 gallons, and I uh, I put about five gallons a week in it. Okay. And it just flows down through here yep. and all, all the way, way down. down. Mm -hmm. And I can water all these cages. Yep. This is the smartest squirrel on the homestead. Last winter, she built a nest. And she's got food here in the chicken coop. <laughs> she doesn't get rained on. And she's protected from predators. <laughs> so that's her nest. That's amazing. So he just comes in and eats the chicken food. Yeah, yeah, yeah he eats the chicken food. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed the little tour of our Cotornix quail setup that we've got going on here. They are very prolific birds. If you don't know anything about Cotornix quail, they are originally from the Middle East and um, Africa and uh, the Mediterranean area and in Europe. And these, if you've read anything about them, they used to sink ships, literally. They would migrate. These are mi not all quail are migratory quail, but these are migratory and they would migrate from southern Europe into like parts of Africa. And if your ship was in the middle of the Mediterranean and they wanted to, you know, take a flight break, they would land on your ship on the tops of the ship and on the rigging. And it would make the tip so or the ship so top heavy, it would fall over and sink. <laughs> and so the sailors in the Mediterranean in the old days used, they used to have methods for making sure the quail would not land on their ships because it could mean devastation. Um, it also goes to show you that this was probably the quail, as mentioned in the book of Exodus, when all of the quail landed and they were knee deep and, you know, literally knee deep in quail. Uh, if you read the Bible, you've, you're probably familiar with that story. These are the type of quail. They are very, very uh, prolific. They, within, I think, it's it, um, 
like seven weeks, they can start laying eggs. And for chickens, it's like 17 weeks or something like that. So they, they start laying eggs right away. They become very fertile and you're inundated with eggs. And so that's one of the reasons I have lots of pickled eggs on the menu. Um, this is uh, spicy, uh, you know, the Frank's Red Hot. Are you, do you like Frank's Red Hot? This is Frank's Red Hot. <laughs> spicy quail with some other spices uh, mixed in with it with some mustard and some other things. So um, lots of great things about quail. It's a meat bird, okay? And it's going to produce for you far quicker than meat birds that your other meat birds that you may be considering. Um, and they're going to produce a lot of protein. So they are protein factories. And that's what we want here on the homestead. You want ways to produce protein. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. You think. Have you ever raised quail? Have you ever raised any other meat birds? Um, there are people out there who do not like raising quail. They think that they are, they're just not worth it, the effort and time. I disagree. And so far, uh, Tim has a lot of experience in doing this. And so I'm grateful that he is, you know, taking on that task to raise the quail. And uh, we can put some of these meat birds up for sale. My kids love eating the quail. There's lots of great recipes. If you've never had quail, I would urge you, you can even find some quail in your supermarket, you know, boxed up. You may find them like four to a pack. They are really tiny. But, you know, two of them is good for a meal if you have, a, you know, a side here and there to go with it. Um, I think you'll find them to be very, very tasty. I love them. My kids love them. They're very, very tender and very tasty birds. And so hopefully we can keep doing this for a while. It's just another way we can grow protein on the homestead. Again, interested in your comments, interested in your recipes. Do you have a favorite quail recipe? My favorite quail recipe is the one from this book, the Nero Wolf Cookbook, the Nero Wolf series uh, by A&E that came out a number of years ago starring Timothy Hutton. Was well, absolutely fantastic. I'm a big fan of that show. It's, for the most part, a very clean show. And there's a cookbook that goes with the original Nero Wolf series that was written back in like the 1930s. And uh, if you really want to go fancy, <laughs> but there's a qu couple quail recipes in here. All that to say, I hope you enjoyed the tour. Give us a like before you go and subscribe if you haven't already. And check out our merchandise over at teamspring.com, our stupid should hurt shirt. If we had more hurt in this world, there'd be an awful lot less stupid. I think we can all agree on that. All right, guys. See you next time in the Homestead. Bye. Hello, everybody. I'm Dean Kane, and I am a big fan of American Homestead, as are you, or you wouldn't be seeing this right now. I'm in my backyard, my homestead, where I grow lots of fruit and vegetables. Look, both Zach and I are big fans of history, and we are watching the economic situation in our country just like you are. We absolutely love this country, and it's very difficult for us to watch it struggle financially. Now, did you know that the Constitution of the United States, in Article 1, Section 10, only allows for legal currency to be minted in gold and silver? I bet you didn't. I wasn't aware, but our founders, in their wisdom, they understood that this was the true way to build a solid financial foundation for this new nation. And they were right. They were dead right. These principles rocketed the industry and the economy that made the United States the powerhouse that we now enjoy. However, today, the U.S. dollar, it's not backed up by anything of real value. And here we are. Now, our friends at Genesis Gold Group are helping people stuck in 401ks, IRAs, and anyone else who's watching their hard-earned wealth teeter on the edge of oblivion by moving their money out of risky paper-denominated assets and into physical precious metals like gold and silver. You can touch it. I'm doing it myself. So is my sister. Call Genesis Gold Group today and let them help you develop a plan to safeguard your assets. It's simple. You can call the number on the screen or visit them at genesisgoldgroup.com. And I will see you next time on the homestead with my dogs and all the fruit that I grow. Look at all this good stuff. You know, we got nectarines, huh? more dogs coming down. Uh, if you get cut, we got some olive oil for, for you. But what, what I do need though is chickens. I need chickens because eggs are about the same price as gold right now. Anyway, see you on the homestead.